Good afternoon. My name is uh, Bruno Jean Etienne. I'm the ACC Europe uh, Belgium chapter representative, and I'm also an in-house lawyer with the company called Train Technology. Thank you for attending this uh, seminar that we are co-organizing with uh, Lydian. ACC Europe, as you may know, is the leading in-house um, community in, in Europe with plus 3,200 uh, members in 90 countries, and worldwide it's close to 4,000 um, 40,000 members in close to 90 uh, countries. So the aim of ACC is really to connect with, to help the in-house community to connect with peers and also to provide you some um, great learning opportunities and also a lot of in-house in -house tool in terms of uh, online library, et cetera. And talking about connectivity, I'm warmly inviting you to the next ACC Europe uh, global conference happening in Brussels between the 16th and 18th of April, 2023. So you will hear a lot more on our social media and, and website. And a word of introduction on, on Lydian. So Lydian is one of the leading independent law firm in, in Belgium. They were founded in 2001, and they are providing a whole range of legal support in all type of law based on their offices, based in Antwerp, Asselt, and also um, Brussels. Together with us, we will have Eve Lenders, which is a partner in the commercial litigation practice and head of port and logistic team. And we will also have Cato Arts, which is a concept in the employment pension and, and benefit practice. And when I started to discuss the topic of today with, um, with Eve and, and Cato, I was coming to the conclusion that when you are in an house lawyer, when it comes to non-compete clause, you are basically always Mr. No, because you tell your business people not to do this cooperation because there will be a lot of competition problem or non-compete element. And when you are also telling the HR community of your company that you cannot hire this individual because he's under a strict non-compete clause, these are the topics that we are always confronted when we are advising our, you know, our internal client. And that's why I thought it was a good topic to, to discuss, especially in a, in a world where post-pandemic, the colleagues are even now more and more virtual because you could, some people have been hired during the pandemic, never came to the office, not, are not really storing information physically in the office, and a lot of secret and company confidential information could be lost if they could be terminated without a proper non-compete clause. So with that, I'll give the floor to, um, to Eve Lenders to start the presentation with the, this topic of non-compete clause in, in the business. Eve, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bruno, for this kind introduction and welcome uh, to you all also on behalf of me. Um, so in this first part, um, I will just uh, introduce the concept of non-compete within the legal uh, market and then talk about the uh, restrictive clauses you can uh, include into your um, contracts, in spe especially the service providers contracts. Um, and then I will pass the floor to uh, Cato who will uh, discuss the principles of um, non-compete in employment uh, relationships. Um, for your questions, to add some practical issue uh, points, you can download the slides uh, under the, uh, the bottom uh, handouts at the right-hand side of your screen, and you can uh, uh, formulate your questions also in the question box uh, right-hand side, and we will uh, come back to those questions after the presentation if we are running out of time, we will certainly uh, revert to you. So um, let's kick off um, an exception to the principle of the free market. That is a non-compete. So we know since the uh, uh, 1791 um, with the French Revolution, there was the decree d'Alarde, um, who was abolished and uh, um, deleted from our legal system. And the Decret de Larde uh, lifted basically the conditions to free market, uh, i.e. being a member of a guild, of a corporation. Um, so that was all abolished and it was freedom, uh, freedom to chase for clients, to chase for business. Um, uh, so it goes way back. It's the corner of our modern free market, at least in, our, um, uh, in, the, most, in the most countries in the world. Um, so competition is essential uh, to the economy and a free market and should be allowed. It's, it's a cornerstone of our free market. However, unless um, the law itself excludes or limits competition. For example, in Belgium, there is a legal uh, prohibition for competition when there is a transfer of business um, as per the uh, company code. 
also you can compete but it has to be fair um, so um, competition applying unfair methods is obviously prohibited what are unfair methods for example blackening a former employer deviating clientele from a current principle to a competitor to a competitor which will be your future employer or principal using trade secrets information for example specific and systematic client databases from a former principal to be used with a new principal with a new com uh, uh, with a new company however bear in mind you cannot erase human mind so when applying and when discussing with clients on unfair competition, you cannot, let's say, prohibit a former employee, a former service provider to use its experience and its know-how know -how gained with your company. Um, that's why indeed the non-compete clause is, uh, let's say, uh, brought to life through case law, because indeed free competition is public order. So all the lawyers amongst us uh, will say you cannot contract against public order or restrict public order. Um, however, case laws accepted it throughout the years, uh, but nevertheless, the limitations uh, should be interpreted strictly as a indeed exception to public order. So notwithstanding public order, we can impose contractual limitations and they are accepted for legitimate reasons and subject to compatibility with the free competition we will discuss that later that are the restrictive conditions for validity of uh, non-compete clauses moreover we even see in case law implicit non-compete obligations that are recognized indeed by the court for example in belgium a company's director is prohibited to compete with the company's business and that's based on the loyalty duty in the performance of the mandate as a director to a company case law limited again um, that it will not apply after re resignation so that implicit implied non-compete obligation will not be valid as soon as the mandate has been terminated um, so as a general principle, we know, as uh, Bruno pointed out, that obviously we want to protect our business and we do not want to see that um, officers, managers, employees um, take away our know-how, our, uh, our clientele. Um, so there are some other, let's say, contractual clauses that can be uh, agreed or, let's say, imposed. We should be, uh, we should say, agreed. Um, and they are distinct from the non-competes. They have also other validity conditions. For example, the strict conditions from employment law will not apply to these uh, other uh, covenants, um, but they will have to be reasonably restricted as they are also limiting the, the effect of them is also limiting the free competition. We are talking about exclusivity, purchase exclusivity, exclusive provision of services, uh, so you cannot work for other competing uh, businesses. We can protect it by confidentiality clauses, obviously, and the ACE confidentiality clauses are uh, quite important also to protect our business. And last but not least, the non-solicitation clauses, so that you cannot indeed recruit, for example, staff members, employees, or even um, go directly to cons uh, customers or suppliers that can be indeed also, uh, in addition to the non-compete, be agreed in the uh, cooperation agreements. So non-compete is one of those, I think, four uh, measures that you can take and that you can agree to protect your business, but please do it when indeed um, engaging and talking about the uh, contracts you enter into. So that's a framework that's, Public order, limited restrictions are allowed, nevertheless. When you go and see to, for example, the contract with a service provider, typical, um, a typical contract, a management agreement, a CFO, a sales manager that doesn't work as a employee, uh, we will see then in the management agreement what we can do. Typically, we talk about three 
validity conditions under general contract law. The non-compete clause must be cumulatively reasonably limited with respect to one duration, geographical scope, and as to the prohibited activities. Um, in Belgium, at least, and I think also in most uh, European countries, there is no financial compensation required to be able to enter into a valid non-compete clause. Obviously, the service provider will try to negotiate a higher fee or a, um, a goodbye fee, a golden handshake at the end of the contract if he sees a non-compete clause imposed to him, uh, preventing him indeed to uh, continue in the same business after the termination um, with the uh, current company. But it's not a validity condition. So financial compensation is not required to have a valid clause. We talk about three conditions that have to be met cumulatively. However, there is a fourth condition which is important and that condition is that the beneficiary must have a legitimate interest to, imbe to impose the non-compete clause. And basically that uh, fourth condition, um, the legitimate uh, interest is the benchmark, so to speak, for the three criteria, the three conditions, um, scope, duration and activity. So indeed it has to be uh, an interest to impose it. It's not a, a, a matter of uh, negotiation power. No. Uh, for example, if you contract a, a CFO and you impose a non-compete also for activities, for example, as a mechanical engineer, to make a, a blunt example, um, you do not have an interest as a company, as a beneficiary, to impose such a restriction to the, uh, C, uh, the CFO. CFO. So that will be the benchmark to assess whether the scope of activities, for example, is, um, is reasonably uh, and proportionately um, excluded. Going to the duration, that's a typical question. How long after the, co uh, uh, the, the cooperation can I impose a non-compete? Because during the cooperation, it is generally admitted that you can impose a non-compete. Um, in most cases, even you can argue that during the cooperation, there is an implicit, uh, implicit non-complete obligation based on the uh, performance in good faith of a contract, a loyalty cooperation during the, um, uh, the cooperation. However, it should be at best also explicitly agreed because you have there always, let's say, a discussion whether certain activities are included um, in, that, uh, in that loyal cooperation uh, duty, yes or no, and I call that lawyer's paradise. So it's good that's not included for us as litigator, but as a legal counsel, um, it's a nightmare because it's quite uh, unpredictive whether the court will follow the assessment the lawyers are making of that um, loyal um, performance of the agreement to scope thereof. After termination, we will indeed benchmark the duration that is allowed uh, to the legitimate interest. So basically, we say the time needed to retain customers, for example, uh, the duration to be able to benefit for a certain know how. Um, and that depends on sector, nature of the cooperation, duration of the cooperation, etc. If you look at case law, in the past, I mean um, uh, last century, um, uh, some case law accepted very long uh, non-compete uh, clauses, even up to 20 years. I found a uh, uh, case law in the uh, 60s of last century, up to 20 years. And nowadays, also because I think there is also much more mobility of service providers and of employees, there is um, much more uh, competition on, let's say, the war for talent. And now we see two years, maximum three years is accepted, but even three years is already uh, a long time. Um, and in very exceptional cases, lower periods are allowed and will be uh, valid, but it has to be indeed proportionate again with that legitimate interest. So basically, if you assess 
the three conditions, validity conditions, it is very important to know where we are coming from and what we are protecting uh, for the company and uh, whether it is proportionate, yes or no. That's a condition that is, um, let's say, um, forgotten in, uh, in many case law as well um, and in contract review and discussions, but that is the best benchmark there is. A second uh, point of restriction which is um, required is the uh, geographical uh, limitation of the competing activities where they are, let's say, uh, prohibited. And that is indeed typically depends on the area in which the beneficiary is active, where the contractor was active, or could exert influence on the market, on clientele, and use his know-how. So if you limit it to the areas where the beneficiary is active, that would be valid. However, if, for example, the beneficiary is active in, uh, in uh, uh, worldwide, but the contractor was only active and has had only influence within the uh, uh, EMEA region or the European region, then probably worldwide will be too large. Because indeed, as said on the, uh, on, on the screen, worldwide literally was accepted by the courts uh, as a limitation in geographical uh, scope because for example a CEO of a global player or even an IT service provider um, there also the limitation of worldwide was accepted because an IT provider can work from his offices in Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada working for a company for example in Belgium. So the, the area to perform the activities um, uh, can also be worldwide and has to be indeed reasonably be argued in the case of a dispute that it is, let's say, proportionate and in the interest of the uh, uh, beneficiary. There is also case law, and that's, let's say, also a part uh, lawyer's paradise to say that if you exclude competing activities and you will not be explicit on, for example, geographical scope, there is case law that accepts that that Close is also limited per se because a competing activity, um, if for example uh, it's a contract covering Europe, then one would say competing activities are those activities that um, are uh, oriented and applied to Europe. So activities, for example, in Australia will be out of scope, and therefore the wording competing activities in a contractual clause will be per se limited. However, um, as legal counsel, I would prefer to be explicit on that because you can, could have, end up with a judge who um, does not agree with my explanation of the per se limitation of the wording competing activities. Uh, sorry, yeah, and then we go to activity indeed. The principle is similar activities that appeal to the same clientele because there indeed there is a legitimate interest. And what we see is there that you have to uh, carefully draft your clause to see the direct and indirect activity. Um, if there is a direct activity, um, it goes to the person that contracted uh, with you, therefore does not apply, for example, uh, a competition via an intermediary, a legal person, management company afterwards, because the management company will do the competing business and not let the principal, the director or the manager um, uh, which is uh, uh, representing that management company. So therefore, therefore, be very explicit as to directly or indirectly uh, competing uh, activities. There is case law that evolves where they see through the legal person um, Brussels, uh, uh, case law of uh, Court of Brussels, um, where they say, okay, there is the competing activity is by the management company, but the intent of the parties was indeed that it was the manager that should be prohibited from competing uh, activities. That are, let's say, the, the general rules under uh, Belgian contract law, which applies in many European uh, uh, jurisdictions. Um, there is some differences by interpretation, etc. But those principles, uh, following basically uh, the abolishment of the Decret d'Alarde and the freedom 
uh, to chase clients and to do business. Um, these are typical conditions. Next to that, there are some specific legislations which I want to point out. It's not exhaustive. For example, commercial agency agreements, um, it falls under the commercial C, uh, the, uh, uh, the directive on commercial agency agreements in Europe, where there is a strict regulation of the non-complete clause, which is quite similar to the principles I have, uh, uh, I have highlighted. Um, condition one, it has to be in writing. Um, that's also good advice for non-commercial agency agreements, but it's indeed limited to the type of matters the agent was in charge of. So it does not relate to the activities of the beneficiaries, just his activities. Two, it is indeed limited to a geographical area that was assigned to the agent. And there is a maximum of six months after contract termination as a maximum for the duration of the, uh, the clause. So you see that if I said two or three years is acceptable, that's already long because indeed of commercial agency agreement, six months. And be aware that the interpretation of, of what the commercial agency agreement is, is quite broad. For example, a sales manager, which is different than the person that goes from door to door selling uh, vacuum cleaners, etc. No, it goes further. It's indeed, any person that intervenes in, uh, let's say, bringing together, mediating a potential buyer with the, the principal. And that is uh, for all types of services, uh, products, services, sales, and purchases. The commercial agency agreement uh, legislation could apply um, and will apply. So that's an important, um, let's say, act to check um, uh, when entering into uh, uh, agreements with any people uh, that is in the sales function or even purchase function within your company. So bear that in mind. Other specific legislation I wanted to touch upon is, uh, perhaps we will have heard about that, it's the Commission Notice 2005 in the framework of the concentration uh, control on European le level, so the merger regulation, where one accepts non-competition clauses or non-compete clauses as a ancillary restraint, um, and they also are allowed when restricted in duration, geographical scope and activity, as to not exceed what is reasonably necessary. So there you see again those four um, validity conditions. And there we have another, let's say, uh, indication, benchmark for what is, is what is justified. And we see three years non compete if there is a transfer of, of uh, customer loyalty in the form of goodwill and know how. And two years is uh, if it only concerns goodwill that has to be protected. So there it's a, let's say, a, a reference, a kind of a benchmark to argue. Uh, that your clause, which could be one year and a half of two years, is uh, valid and reasonably uh, limited in time. In several jurisdictions, indeed, one referred to this uh, commission notice uh, for non-EU merger matters, so in all kinds of uh, disputes and contracts. Um, but uh, let's say national uh, judges do not tend to accept it. I only found one in Austria where we where we see that it was explicitly referred to this commission notice or the case of says, okay, it doesn't apply here. I will not take it as a benchmark, but um, uh, it's important. I think it's nevertheless a useful reference. As you know, EU and national competition law, a non-compete clause is obviously or can be, um, uh, can have a limitation of the free market and it will be indeed um, not accepted is if it has a, if your contract and your uh, cooperation has a noticeable uh, influence on the market. And then we talk about the market shares, um, and that's more for distribution contracts and for larger uh, uh, supply or uh, purchase agreements. What, is my, what, if my, what if my clothes that must meet these requirements? What is the sanction? Is it per se invalid? Yes, was the answer up to 2005 in Belgium. Um, it was an absolute nullity, and even the court could 
uh, in, raise that and, and, and decide on that ex officio, because indeed it would be a, uh, a breach uh, of public order. Um, and the consequence were, was then that indeed that clause did not apply. However, any statutory non-compete clauses would remain in force. Recently, I mean, recently for a lawyer, 2005, the Cour de Cassation in Belgium, the Belgian Supreme High Court, accepted that a clause should not be uh, declared invalid in its entirety if the parties contractually agreed that it can be mitigated by the court. So indeed now, if it is foreseen in a contractual clause, the court can mitigate and so restrict basically the uh, uh, non-compete clause. If you write three years and the court finds it not reasonably restricted, it can lower the uh, duration to one year, six months, depending on, on the matter at hand. So therefore, please include, and I have an inspirational clause uh, later on, please include that in your contract so that the court will have the power, the authority to mitigate and that the sanctions, the sanction is not the absolute nullity. Does that mean that you do not have to think good about these conditions when contracting? I don't think so. I think uh, it's, it's important that you have a clause that you can rely upon, because if you write a clause that is valid for, let's say, two years after termination, and it is considered to be, it, it is too long, and it will be mitigated by the court, you never know on beforehand um, to what term, to what duration the court will mitigate it. So you are there also in a uh, gray area, and, and it will be difficult to, to manage. Sanctions for violation, that's clear, I think. Um, there is the tip and the advice to include lump sum damages um, in the case of an infringement of a breach of the non-compete clause, because a breach of non-compete clause, but the sanction is contractual liability, and you uh, can see comp compensations for the damage suffered. However, to prove and to evidence in court the loss of contract opportunity suffered by the beneficiary as a result of the breach, I would say good luck. You cannot, it will be very difficult to demonstrate to the court that you have a, a decrease of turnover, let's say 10%, because that person, that sales manager went to the competition. The causal link uh, between two events will be uh, very, 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 very hard to, uh, to render. Obviously, it can be the dissolution of the agreement, even on compete clause is uh, within the duration. And you could go uh, to the uh, summary, uh, judge, uh, summary proceedings to have a cease and desist order, performance in kind. This is, let's say, um, very uh, rarely granted by the courts in the, in the event of a non-compete clause. It's a typical action for the unfair uh, competition um, uh, claims. A very important one, and uh, before handing the floor, uh, giving the floor to uh, Cato, is the third party complicity to uh, breach of contract. If you are hiring a service provider that was active with a competitor, um, and you know that your service provider had a non-compete clause, and by entering into the contract, obviously you will assist the service provider in breaching that clause, you can be held severable liable for the damages, for example, the lump sum damages that the service provider uh, will have to pay to its former principal. So the third party complicity is a, a, a quite important, uh, say, um, mechanism, uh, in my opinion, uh, in the framework of non-compete and hiring and firing. Um, for example, if I know, and I'm in, let's say, a little bit in dispute, for example, with my CFO, and I know he's talking with a com uh, competitor, I will write to the competitor to say, okay, I know he's writing, but know that that CFO has a non-compete clause, uh, uh, that, uh, that has a non-compete clause with me, so you cannot enter into business with him. If you would do so, um, I think indeed that um, your CFO will not go to the com uh, competition. Um, that's an, a very important point. So what we see is that 
if we uh, uh, launch actions, uh, court actions against a former CFO or former service provider, we typically try to do it also to the new employer, the new principal, and uh, uh, hold him liable uh, based on third party uh, complicity to breach of contract. Then I have on screen a, a close for inspiration where you see the different elements um, that we discussed. So the three um, validity um, conditions, the lump sum damages, uh, and the, finally uh, the, the wording that the scope can be limited by the judge to the maximum allowed by law. So this was my part, and I pass the floor to uh, Cato for indeed the restriction of competition in employment law relationships. Thank you. Thanks, Eve. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kato Aerts, indeed, and I'm very happy to be here and welcome you all to uh, the second part of this webinar, where I will discuss the restriction of competition clauses in employment law relationships. Of course, employment law is a bit different from commercial law. Um, throughout Europe, empl employment law really aims at protecting the employee. So, of course, if you're going to restrict the employee's possibilities of competing with their former employer, um, that is going to be restricted by law. That is the case in Belgium, but it's also the case in many other European countries. And from uh, an employment law perspective, a distinction should be made between competition or non-competition obligations during the employment relationship on the one hand and after the employment relationship. During the employment relationship, at least in Belgium, there is an implicit non-compete clause in every employment contract. So first of all, to start with, an employment contract should not be uh, in writing in Belgium. It can also be an oral contract, but you do not even need a contract to prove that an employee cannot compete with their employer. So that's a very basic principle in Belgium. If you are entering into an employment contract with an employer, that means that you're going to be loyal to that employer and you're as such not going to compete with that company. Um, it's also the case in France, for instance, where uh, there is an obligation of loyalty, um, which also comprises uh, the idea that an employee cannot compete against their employer. Now, after the employment contract, that's a different story. Um, of course, unfair competition is, and might sound um, reasonable, logical, is also uh, prohibited, uh, not necessarily because of a contract that you have in place with a former employee, but because it would be contrary to, let's say, even commercial legislation um, and, and fair competition acts in, in all uh, the respective countries. Um, if you are going to restrict fair competition, on the other hand, you're going to need a competition, a non-competition clause with the employee, and that will be subject to very strict formalities depending on the jurisdiction you're in. Um, we will discuss the main um, requirements from a Belgian law perspective a bit later in this presentation. So what is unfair competition or fair competition during um, the employment uh, contract? Because both are prohibited even without a clause, as I said. Um, first of all, it's a very uh, broad uh, definition or a very broad scope because there is no requirement to have a breach of um, uh, trade practices or trade secrets. Um, any breach of loyalty can be sanctioned and it can even be severely sanctioned. So competing with the, employee, in, with the employer um, is usually considered as a um, reason justifying a, dis a dismissal for cause. Under Belgian law, that means that the employment contract can be terminated at all times without compensation and without notice. And it's the case in many other jurisdictions. Of course, it's always a fact factual assessment. So whether um, a certain breach of loyalty will indeed be serious enough to um, justify that dismissal for cause will have to be assessed by a court. But generally speaking, uh, competing with the employer because of that duty of loyalty will indeed uh, justify a dismissal for cause. Um, whether or not the employment contract is suspended during a certain period of time, that would, for instance, be the case if the employee is out sick or if they're on holiday or if uh, they've come to uh, any kind of arrangement with the employer to temporarily suspend their performance of the employment contract, that obligation remains in place. So it's strictly irrelevant whether or not an employee is actually carrying out work for their employer. As long as they're bound by an employment contract with their employer, that means that they cannot compete with that employer. And any uh, employee doing that is uh, indeed sanctionable by a uh, dismiss dismissal for cause. It's also relevant um, how that employee would be uh, competing with their employer, whether they do that on behalf of their own account as a self-employed person, 
or whether they are engaging in an employment relationship with another employer. So that is strictly um, irrelevant. And of course, what is competition? Um, I can easily rephrase what Eve mentioned because here the same reasoning applies. It's basically regarding companies who target the same clients and who offer products or services that are alternatives. So it's a very broad definition. It doesn't necessarily need to be um, Adidas versus Nike or uh, any other type of um, uh, yeah, competitors um, that are very logical. Um, if they're offering alternatives, then that can be um, a, a, comp a competing uh, business um, for the purposes of this um, evaluation. So under Belgian law, um, there is lots of case law. I'm sure there is in many other many other jurisdictions as well as to what is um, unfair, what is a breach of loyalty, what isn't. And I thought it was interesting to give you a, a brief flavor of um, things that have been accepted by courts and things that haven't. Um, because as you will see on the, the left hand side of the slide, um, serious cause is for instance, obviously engaging deliberately and actively in competing activities with the employer. So for instance, soliciting their clients um, engaging with another employer and um, earning commissions for any activities performed for that competing uh, business. Um, it's also um, you know, approaching clients uh, claiming that uh, another company is offering a better alternative. So these are all examples of cases where an employee was according to the judge validly dismissed for cause. What's interesting is to know what is not. And what is not is, for instance, of course, applying for a job with a competitor. Um, any employee is free to do that. And it's not because they have the intention of joining a competitor that they are already breaching their duty of loyalty towards their current employer. Um, a very um, interesting one also is shareholdership in a competing company. Uh, case law has evolved over time. It used to be the case that just holding shares in a competing business was indeed justifiable, uh, a justifiable reason to dismiss for cause. That is no longer the case because case law considers that you can be a shareholder, a silent shareholder, not really pursuing competing activities um, as an employee, um, which would also mean that you cannot be dismissed because of that reason. Of course, if it is combined with other activities and actively pursuing competing businesses um, and, and um, working for another uh, company, then that would change matters, but just shareholdership as such is not sufficient enough. Um, the same is true for the intention to compete with your employer. An employee can validly start preparing any competing activity to start off with that as soon as the employment contract has come to an end. That could, for instance, be registering with um, the Crossroad Bank for Enterprises, uh, founding a company, um, drafting documents, as long as they are not actively engaging in the competing business and they are not entering the market as a competitor. That's just an intention. It's preparatory work and that also is not sanctionable with a dismissal for cause. Now, unfair competition after the employment contract, again, a big parallel uh, to be made with uh, commercial contracts. There is no legal definition, but um, basically it means um, competition contrary to fair practices in commercial, industrial and service matters. So again, a very factual appreciation, um, but anything that's unfair, so uh, contrary to, to the law, to trade practices, um, is indeed always prohibited. You do not need to have a specific clause to prevent employees from doing that, even after the employment contract has come to an end. Examples are solicitation of an ex-employer's uh, customers or um, um, staff. Um, both are actually uh, but the same reasoning. Um, any employee can solicit their former employer's staff or clients and can try to actually compete with them. But as soon as there is a dishonest element coming into play. For instance, if you do that to destabilize the competitor's business, if you do that with false information, if you do that by pretending things that aren't true or could be misleading, then of course that will be considered unfair competition, which will not be allowed. A few examples uh, from case law, um, a sales representative creating the impression that they are the only one to contact um, for a certain product um, that their new employer is selling, but that they're uh, previous employer was also selling um, and if that information is indeed incorrect and the old employer is still active in that business that is indeed unfair and not permissible. Um, another example is sales representatives granting large discounts in view of you know attracting potential customers terminating the cooperation with their former um, employer. So those are only a few examples of what is uh, considered unfair. Now limiting fair competition because you know Talking about unfair uh, competition, um, 
that's fairly clear, I think, for everyone that as soon as, as if there is a dishonest element into um, into into play, that that is not allowed. But how do you limit an employee who is not really planning on doing anything dishonestly, but who wants to compete with the business of the former employee and uh, employer? Sorry. And under Belgian law, that can be restricted or that should be restricted by a non-compete clause. Um, we have several types of non-compete clauses, not to make things complicated, but that's just how the law um, is in Belgium. And we have a very uh, general uh, scope, uh, a very general uh, non-compete clause uh, that applies to all employees. Um, but then we also have some uh, specific cases for international businesses where employees are not just restricted to the territory of Belgium and then also for uh, sales representatives which is a specific category under Belgian law of employees who you know look and visit prospect customers on behalf of their employer and uh, negotiate sales deals with these um, customers. Non-compete clause, um, first of all the enforceability and validity conditions. As I mentioned at the start of this webinar, um, Belgian employment law, as is the case for any employment law in Europe, is protective of the employee. And so there are strict conditions that need to be complied with in order to impose a valid non-compete obligation on the employee. We distinguish enforceability conditions and validity conditions. Enforceability basically means that the clause, as valid as it may be, will only be enforceable towards certain categories of employees. And generally, generally, that's linked to their salary. So under a threshold of 36,000 euros per year, any non-compete uh, clause, whether it's um, you know limited enough uh, in terms of geography, uh, timing, um, activities, even if it's valid, will not be enforceable because that employee simply is not earning enough money to make it justified um, and, and impose that obligation on the employee. Anything above 75,000, if I recall correctly, will be valid. And in between, it's only valid if there is a specific collective bargaining agreement um, allowing uh, a non-compete obligation towards that employee. Um, good to know is that even if the employee is not earning enough money yet, but might uh, exceed that threshold during their employment, um, it's already interesting to include a non-compete clause in their employment contract um, because obviously you have more leverage at the start of an employment to conclude such clause than you do during the employment relationship and you never know how things might evolve and what uh, salary the employee will be earning at the time um, that the employment contract is terminated. And then there are the validity um, conditions. These will all sound familiar to you because they're basically the same as in a commercial um, relationship with one exception. So to start off with the activities, you need similar activities, obviously, otherwise the businesses wouldn't be competing. But what's very specific, specific for an employment law context is that there needs to be a double similarity. An employee, um, let's say an accountant employed by uh, a, big, um, a, a big company, could easily um, start competing or start for a competing business um, in another role. So from accountancy to HR, that would be perfectly fine and is not uh, in line with double um, sim similarity that is required on uh, the activity uh, component. So basically, it would only apply to um, an HR person with a certain uh, company doing the exact same activities, being an HR person for a competitor in the market. Um, if they're going to do a totally different role, um, the uh, non-compete clause uh, will not apply. And it's also necessary in Belgium, at least, to point that out in the contract that it regards similar activities, the same role for the uh, as the employee is currently undertaking with their employer within a competing business um, elsewhere. Um, secondly, it should also be geographically limited, first of all, to the place where the employee can effectively compete with the employer. Um, that basically means that uh, we'd have to look at where the employer is already active, because in places where the employer is not active, an employee cannot uh, compete with their employer. Um, and there is no possibility to take future evolutions into account. That will be the case for uh, a deviating international uh, non-compete clause, but I'll discuss that in a minute. Um, and it's, in any event, um, limited to the territory of Belgium. Outside of that, you'd have to look into another uh, compete non-compete obligation. It should also be limited in duration, uh, maximum 12 months. And then last, but certainly not least, and that's the least fun part of it, uh, a financial compensation needs to be paid to the employee, which amounts to 50% of the employee's salary for the restricted period. So let's say you have an, a non-compete obligation of 12 months. It means you'll have to pay the employee six months of salary to compensate the non-compete obligation. Um, 
Under Belgian law, there are also specific rules as to when the clause has effect or not. It's after six months, etc. It would lead us a bit too far into detail to discuss all of that. Uh, the thing that you should really recall uh, with regards to the effect of the uh, non-compete clause is that whenever an employee takes the initiative to terminate the contract, that the clause will likely have effect. Um, so whenever the termination is um, attributable to the employee. That also means, for instance, that if you are going to dismiss someone for cause under Belgian law, and you might have very good reasons to do that, for instance, because if the employee um, um, stole something or committed fraud, was dishonest, um, whatever you can think of, you always need to be wary of waiving the non-compete clause to avoid uh, payment of that financial compensation. So as I mentioned already, the difference between enforceability clauses and um, or enforceability conditions and validity conditions is that with the enforceability condition, you can already include a non-compete clause in the contract and you can just simply wait and assess at the time of termination whether or not the enforceability conditions are met. Is the employee making enough money? Yes or no. For the validity conditions, that's a different story. If you have an invalid non-compete clause, um, it is sanctioned uh, with nullity, and it's a so-called relative nullity, which basically means that it can be invoked by the person whose activities are restricted, being the employee. It will be the employee who will be able to say, listen, this clause is not valid because it's not limited to the territory of Belgium, or it's too long, it's for 24 months, and it should only be for 12 months, and they can invoke that invalidity uh, and the nullity of that contract with the small nuance, and that's very important, that they could still claim the financial compensation. Um, so there, there is case law uh, confirming that indeed not all validity conditions were complied with, but since the clause is there, or the, re the rules are there to protect the employee, the employee could easily argue, well, at least I had the legitimate expectation to not compete with my former employer, so I did not even explore that. Um, I went do it down a different path um, for my professional activities. And because of that, I need to be uh, compensated. So there is case law in Belgium confirming that indeed the financial compensation needs to be paid to an employee, even if the non-compete clause is not valid. Can a non-compete clause be moderated? Basically, if you do not comply with conditions and it's too long, it's not linked to similar activities, there is no financial compensation, what can a judge do? Uh, under Belgian law, some discussion legal doctrine. Um, ultimately, it was decided by one legal scholar that it should be possible, but our Supreme Court said it isn't. So I wouldn't dare to start that discussion. It's only useful if you're ever in a discussion already. Um, but what's interesting is that in France, for instance, um, judicial moderation is permitted. A deviating non-compete clause, as I mentioned, is when you have international field of activities or an own research department and your employees are um, performing a role uh, where they have knowledge of certain activities of the company and when using that knowledge, um, they would be able to harm the company on an international scope. And there, um, the eligib eligibility and validity conditions can be derived from. Um, the scope, the geographical scope, can be much broader than the territory of Belgium. Uh, it can be any country in the world. But what is required is that you list the countries that the uh, non-compete obligation applies to in the contract itself. What is not allowed is to just refer to the European Union. As we all know, that uh, things might change over time and one country might be part of the European Union one day and might not be uh, part of it any longer uh, on, the, on the other day. So that's why um, a list of countries is really required in the contract. Um, with the upside, a uh, good point there, that it's not limited to where the employee can effectively compete with the employer. So as an international business, you could argue that you are planning in five, ten years to also deploy activities in um, Asia, for instance, well, then you can list those countries that you think are relevant and that you might have uh, business in, in a few years uh, already in the non-compete clause. Um, so that's broader than the general one. Um, the duration is also longer. Um, you can go up to two or three years even. So that's much longer than the 12 months for a normal non-compete clause. And deviations are again possible when the um, clause can be invoked. As I mentioned, it's usually only when the employee takes the initiative or is at fault when terminating the contract. Um, here you can even go broader and um, let it apply also to situations where the employer is actually terminating the contract. For a sales representative, again, um, different conditions. The main one is that there is no financial compensation to be paid to the sales representative, um, but 
Uh, that's not entirely good news um, for a sales representative. Uh, there is a clientele indemnity, a goodwill indemnity that needs to be paid when a sales representative is being terminated, which basically balances out the fact that there is no financial compensation for a non-compete um, in the contract. It's even uh, the case that a non-compete in the contract will create the presumption that the sales representative has indeed brought new business to um, the employer, which will only increase the chances of having to grant and pay a goodwill indemnity to the sales representative. So both go hand in hand, um, but it's important to know that if you have a specific contract in front of you for a sales representative, the clause will not be invalid if there is no financial compensation included. Waiver. Um, probably when you were listening to my explanation on the financial compensation, which, which is quite considerable, um, it's very important to know if you can still get out of that contract, if you can waive the non-compete, if in the end um, the interest of the company uh, in having the employee respect the non-compete obligation does not outweigh their obligation of paying such uh, important financial compensation. Well, the answer is yes, uh, an employment, con uh, uh, sorry, a non-compete obligation can indeed be waived um, after the employment contract, but it should be done within 15 days after termination. There are no formal requirements, but obviously, if you want to prove afterwards that you did waive the non-compete, you want to do that in writing, in due time, dated, so that there is no discussion there. Um, some employers have been creative in Belgium and have actually rephrased the wording of a non-compete um, obligation, where they said, it will be waived if we do not uh, state the contrary within 15 days after termination of the contract. And that was recently actually accepted by a Belgian court. So you can be a bit creative because, of course, there's always a risk that if an employee leaves their employment, um, a company might have a tendency of saying, okay, that's done and over with, on to the next one. And they don't think about it anymore. But it's precisely in that scenario where an employee is resigning that you need to waive the non-compete if you want to avoid payment of the financial compensation. And of course, it must also be certain. Some employers have argued, well, I haven't paid a financial compensation. So basically, that means I did not want to enforce the non-compete. Uh, their case law is very strict and has said, no, we do need an explicit waiver of that non-compete. It cannot be uh, inferred from uh, the employer's failure to pay the financial compensation. For a sales representative, there is no such mechanism. Makes sense because, of course, there is no financial compensation to be paid. But if at any time you'd want to do that, you can include it in the um, clause itself. It's a contractual right to waive is accepted by case law, or you could come to an arrangement with a former sales representative in a termination agreement to um, decide what the result will be. Now, what happens if an employee breaches their obligations? Um, then, of course, the financial compensation that was paid by the employer will need to be reimbursed on one part. Second step is that the employee is liable to pay the same amount to the employer to compensate any losses, unless in a third step, the employer can prove that there is actually higher damages sustained, and then the employee should indeed um, make sure that all of those damages are uh, compensated. And then an employer can additionally also claim immediate cessation of the competing activities, might also possibly claim third-party complicity in a breach of contract, as Eve explained, that's exactly the same mechanism for an employment law relationship. Um, but of course, it's very important that an employer will be able to establish the breach, um, which is always a factual assessment, not always easy, to be honest, in practice. Um, some might even uh, hire a private detective or an investigator to make sure that the, uh, the breach of the non-compete clause can be established. And here is a short overview, because of course, I'm a Belgian employment lawyer. I basically spoke about Belgian employment law with some international components to it. But this is an overview of everything that I've told you um, that applies in other European uh, countries as well. So you can see the Netherlands, Austria, France, Switzerland, UK, Spain, Italy, Luxembourg, and Germany. And all of the questions on the left-hand side of the slide are um, a summary of what I've told you today. And so you can easily check whether it's a yes or no uh, answer in those countries as well. As well. Bear in mind that it's very difficult for an, uh, a lawyer to answer yes or no to a question. There's always a nuance there. So in some cases, um, my colleagues in the other countries have added a bit of wording there. Uh, obviously, it will also be a factual assessment. Um, but that's it from my end. Uh, thank you very much on behalf of Lydian. And then I pass the floor to Bruno to close the webinar. Thank you, Kato, for uh, for this uh, in very interesting, uh, very international, I will say, in Belgium, but also outside of Belgium explanation on those non-compete clause, because it's true that 
even though we are, uh, most of us are based in Belgium, as in our sponsor, we advise, I will say, our internal client all over Europe. So it's really always appreciable to have a kind of uh, a more international and, and European view. So thank you for making the effort. And thank you also for Eve of uh, helping us to, to understand how it works, I will say, in the real business world and how we can better advise our um, internal, uh, internal client. So with that, I'm closing the, the, the seminar. Just to recall that uh, by attending this seminar, you have been getting some point with the uh, Institut des Juristes Belges d'Entreprise, EBGE. So you will be able to, um, to use the certificate that will be generated by uh, GoToMeeting and Lydian on this purpose. And with that, I wish you a good, uh, good afternoon. And it, we are really leaving you on time. So then you can go back to your your day-to-day -day routine. And we are hoping to welcome you for some in-person seminar together with Lydian at, uh, at, at the end of the summer and in, and in the fall. So have a nice afternoon. Bye-bye.